Hey there and welcome to this new video. So in this video I want to talk about reverse shell encryption. So what's the idea? Well, the idea is that when we study like penetration testing, ethical hacking, whatever, right? When we, said, when we study this kind of things, most often we will see payloads for reverse shells like the following one. The one with bash or like for example this one in Python, right? And so we see people, I also have videos in which I use these payloads so use these payloads to obtain a reverse shell. And as is always is the context with reverse shell, basically the idea is that you have an attacker listening on a server, right? So attacker is listener. And then you have the victim, which connects back to the attacker. And in this connection, you establish a TCP socket. And in this socket, you send like um, the um, commands and the output of those commands. So basically the attacker sends the commands to the victim the victim executes the commands and sends back the results of those commands, right? So you have this kind of TCP socket. Now, so for example, let's just do a trivial example. Here, what do we have? We have, let's open two shells in here. So we have terminal one and terminal two. In terminal one, I'm going to go listen with netcat here. And in terminal two, I'm going to open a shell with bash, like this, right? Now, in this case, the attacker now has a shell. And in this shell, I can do like ID. I can do ls, I can do mi, you know, I have all this kind of access to the system, right? And all this data flows in the network, flows in the TCP socket. So in this context here, I have a local loss endpoint, but consider that you are attacking a remote server, then the data that goes from your machine to the server actually traverses the network, right? Traverses a series of machines. And indeed, this is the problem with the classical reverse shell. All this data is in plain text. There is no encryption, there is no cryptography. Everyone can see the data. And for example, if we use TCP dump, we can actually see it in practice. So let's use TCP dump and let's listen to everything that is sent to port 4321, which is the port that we are currently using for our example reverse shell. So I'm going to listen here down below with this shell. Here on top here, I'm going to listen for the traffic on this other. So I'm going to listen for the traffic. And on this shell down, I'm going to activate the reverse shell connection. So basically, the idea is that here on top, you're going to see a bunch of packets, a bunch of data that is sent between the uh, victim machine and the attacker machine. Now, in this case, they are both my machine, but imagine it's a remote server, right? Now let's see what happens when here on the left, I press uh, like, who am I, right? I press who am I. Now notice that I obtain the response, which is Leo, right? It is my username. Now notice what the eavesdropper, the one who's sniffing the network sees. In this traffic, uh, as you can see here, uh, there is the who am I repeated multiple times uh, because the first one is the command the attacker sends to the victim. And the second one is the response of the victim which repeats the command, and also we get the actual username, Leo, right? And we can do this with other commands, like for example, ID. I do ID, and here on the traffic, I get the ID sent over the network. So what's the idea? Well, the idea is simple. It means that all the data that is sent in this reverse shell is not encrypted, is in plain text, and everyone can just sniff it out. If you have a connection within the series of um, of networks in which you go through, you get sniffed out, okay? So like this, all the data is exposed to the internet. And this can be a problem. It can be a problem because number one, it can be easy to do detection on such data. And number two, like yeah, if, you, if you have then a forensic analysis after an incident, you can really discover what was going on. So it's not really secure from an attacker point of view, right? You don't want to do that. So what do you do instead? Well, the idea is that, okay, we want to encrypt this channel. We want to encrypt this socket so that the data is actually encrypted. We're not going to trigger a detection mechanism, a detection system, like super easy, because that's what happens with plain text value being sent over the network. We're going to have to make less noise on this matter, right? So what's the idea? Well, the idea is that we can use the TLS protocol. Now, the TLS protocol is already heavily used when we connect to a website using HTTPS. For example, here I have my website, so example.sh, right? So this website here, if I just 
Consider here, look at this, it says connection is secure. And we have a certificate, and it means when we see this connection is secure, it means that the communication channel between our browser and the server is secure. So let me be clear again, it means that the communication channel between client and server, it is this channel who is secure. The connection is secure. Now many times people have this wrong assumption that HTTPS means that the server is secure. However, that's not really the case, right? We don't know anything about the server. We only know that the, co the connection is uh, secure, right? So that's the main uh, thing that the TLS um, connection does. Of course, with the, with the certificate mechanism, we also can certify that the server owns a private key associated to the certificate. So it gets a little bit more complex than that. We do have some guarantees. For example, if you connect to google.com, and we have a valid Google certificate that gives us some information about the knowledge of the server we are connecting to. However, it does not necessarily mean that this server is secure, right? It's just that connection is secure. However, in this context, we are only interested in securing the connection because we know that we are attacking a victim. We know that our attacker server, you know, we control it. So we are just interested in securing the connection, which is exactly what the TLS protocol does. And in a TLS connection here, as you can see, what we have is, we have, for example, our application data, which is HTTP. Now, this is wrapped over a TLS packet, which is wrapped over a TCP packet, which is wrapped over an IP packet. So in terms of layer, we have application layer, we have session layer, which deals with cryptography, we have connection layer here, and then we have IP layer, network layer, okay? So basically, that is the protocol stack, right? And to enable this TLS, uh, to enable this encryption, we can use various tools. And here in this video, I'm going to showcase two examples, NCAT and OpenSSL. But of course, there are many different ways to do it, and you can even roll your own encryption. In this video, we will see ways in which we can use the TLS protocol to establish cryptography, to establish protection of the communication channel. Right? So that's the idea. So let's start with NCAT. Now, NCAT is the NetCat client that is installed when you install Nmap. What does it mean? It means that in target systems, most often you don't find such binary because most target systems, they do not need Nmap. Typically, Nmap is found in computers that do offensive operations or penetration testing in general. But basically, if you find NCAT in the system, what you can do is you can Listen like I did before with NetCat, with the classical NetCat. However, this time we use NCAT, so not NC, and we use the flag dash dash SSL, right? And other than that, it's the same flag for the traditional NetCat. So we have this kind of thing. So we listen here. As you can see here, it says generating a temporary 2048 RSA key. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, on the client, when we want to connect, we can use NCAT SSL 4321-E bin bash, right? So we also have to use NetCat on the victim machine because it is required to establish a connection, right? We, it is no longer a simple TCP socket. Right now, on top of the TCP socket, you have to handle all the TLS interaction. Now, the TLS interaction typically contains a handshake, and then there is the session itself that is established and the handshake is used to exchange cryptographic materials between the client and the server, right? So that's the idea. Now we can use this however and we can connect. Now the cool thing though is uh, let's try to open once again our, um, our uh, TCP dump, right? So the port is also 4321, so we have the same port. Here we're gonna connect, okay? So let's execute for example a command say id. So wait, here it's going to ask me for the password. So let's do it again. I'm going to listen. I'm going to connect, but here I have to put my password. So let's put the password. So now I'm listening for the traffic. I'm going to connect on this uh, down right shell. I'm going to connect. As you can see here, we have some data, right? But as you can see here, it seems all encrypted. There's like, it's really hard to make sense of it, right? Well, this data that we saw was the TLS and shake, basically. So now the TLS and shake is over and we can send our data. We can say, for example, ID. I do ID. Notice that here I sent the ID. I got the response from the server. 
But if you now try and search for the response in here, notice that we do not find anything. You know, you can search for it. You can even do like a hard, like a quick search with Emacs of this thing, but nothing is gonna be found. Why? Because the data that runs in the packets is now encrypted. So with this simple setup, we've managed to encrypt our data, which means now that we are we are less likely to activate the detection systems. It doesn't mean that we will avoid all detection systems, by the way, because there are other methods to understand if data is encrypted. For example, detection system could perform entropy analysis and realize that there is a lot of traffic with high entropy because encrypted data has by design high entropy and so that could emit some warnings regarding to that but the cool thing though is that if you try to analyze what is going on you actually have no clue what is going on okay so that's a simple way to secure our channel now the catch on this of course is that as we said this command is available only if you have compiled and map if you have downloaded and map however there is a way to get through that and the idea is that well you can have a static version of this binary and when you have a static version, which by the way, you can download here, for example. So here it's a simple way to download the static version of NCAT. And I'm using this repository of Andrew-D static binaries. So I highly suggest it. So basically here, as you can see, so we're going to make it executable with cmod plus x. And this NCAT is statically linked. It means that it does not depend on any dynamic libraries. The only thing that you need to make sure is the architecture, is that the architecture matches with your target. So if you are downloading this x86-64, you want to make sure that your target has this CPU architecture. Otherwise, of course, it's not gonna it's not gonna execute basically. But uh, once we have this, uh, we can use it as we did previously here, uh, and uh, we're just gonna be able to do the same thing as before, right? Now do this, uh, and we check the traffic once again. I can do id. Here I get a message, but here I just get encrypted data. So I get nothing new. And uh, here I have something like uh, about NCAT, but not much here, basically. So I don't get the, the actual data of the commands themselves. So another way is by using OpenSSL. So not NetCat anymore, but OpenSSL. So OpenSSL, of course, is very commonly found in these different distributions because many binaries are linked with OpenSSL. Like, for example, Nginx can be linked with OpenSSL. Now, if we want to use OpenSSL, the first step is that we will have to generate a self signed certificate. And we need to generate this because basically our attacker is going to simulate a TLS server, and TLS servers need a TLS certificate. Now, we don't need to generate one that is official, we just need to say to have a self signed certificate, and here we can put any value that we want. For example, this is an example command. We execute it on the shell and look at this we get basically our uh, here there is some um, output like this and here we have this sir.key and key.pm sir.pem and key.pem basically so that's the idea now if you're interested in obtaining the details of your certificate there is this other OpenSSL x509 command and here you get all the data of the certificate however this is not a video about tls certificates if you're interested in that however let me know and i will create something on that at this point, we have to listen with TLS. So here is this command. We say OpenSSL as underscore server, and then we put the key and the TLS certificate. Because by the way, when we created this self signed certificate, we have also generated a private RSA key, right? And we push it into key.pem. So we have the key and we have the certificate. Now at this point, at this point, what happens is that we have to connect from the client to the server. Now this connection uses this command with the make FIFO with the named pipes, but the core idea is that we have OpenSSL as underscore client. So this is the command that we're interested in. So we execute this on the shell here, and we have a connection. Like look in the left, here we have once again a shell. Now if we check on the data this being transfer, here I say ID, Notice that data is being transfer transferred, so this is not a local shell, this is a remote shell, but we do still do not see the data, okay? So it's back as before, basically, we have this thing, but we do not see the data, and uh, let me go up here, and basically that's the idea. 
Now, this commando is very useful, it's very interesting to analyze because it kind of makes you understand why we need named pipes. So why we need this make FIFO, DMP, F, and then all this stuff, what is the main loop of the data. So here we have finished with this test. Also notice this, which, is, which I think is interesting and worth to note. Here, when we say this certificate, it's going to say verify return one. It's going to say verify error self-signed certificate. So technically speaking, this TLS certificate is not valid because it is self-signed. Now, when you self-sign a certificate, the browser is going to meet an error because it's going to say basically, look, I don't trust this certificate, okay? Be careful who you're connecting to. Now, this connection could still be vulnerable to men in the middle attack. However, in the context of an attacker, most often you actually generate on the fly these kind of things, so you are less uh, focused on that. Like you can allow this kind of um, this kind of risk, so to speak. Else, you will have to use another method to establish authenticity to your attacker server, which maybe you know is a fun topic that we can explore in the future. So to have custom uh, like methods to establish authenticity, basically. But for now, we just have a self certificate. And what the way I want to end this video though is by analyzing this payload and analyzing why it works the way it works, right? So what's the idea? Well, first of all, we have this diagram, which I think it's very useful to understand what is going on. So we start by creating a main pipe, and this pipe is called slash tmp slash f, right? Then we're gonna activate a shell with bash with a dash i. We're gonna read the input from this pipe. So the bash process is going to read the input from this, uh, from this name pipe. And initially, of course, no input is going to come, so it's going to be fine. Now, when it comes to the standard output and error, so this thing is going to pipe with a traditional pipe into an OpenSSL client, which connects to the attacker, right? And the attacker will actually write back to the pipe. And the pipe is going to be read by the shell, which is going to execute and pipe the output back to the OpenSSL. So basically, the idea is that the TLS is handled by this OpenSSL loop, by the OpenSSL command, and then the input-output loop, basically we have that the output of the attacker is written into the shell, is written into the name pipe, the name pipe is read by the shell, the shell executes the commands and pipes the output back to the attacker. And so this is the way that we get our the attacker sends the command, the shell executes it and sets back the results. So basically, we can also write the following. We create an name pipe, we start the shell, and then the shell reads data from the name pipe. The output of the shell is sent to the OpenSSL client. The OpenSSL client sends the data encrypted to the OpenSSL server. The server sends a new command to the client. The client decrypts a new command and writes it to the name pipe. And this creates a loop, basically. This creates a never ending loop in which we just go through this all over again. So we have a typical reverse shell, but the cool thing is that since we're using OpenSSL, the data that goes through the network, which is this one, right? This bit goes through the network and could be potentially exposed, could be detected by detection systems and things of the sort. That bit is encrypted through TLS, right? And that is exactly what we want. And that is what makes this approach different from a traditional reverse shell. So basically that's the idea. Now I hope this video was useful. I hope you learned something out of it. If you do, please let me know. Please you can subscribe to the channel. If you want to support my work, there is a Patreon link in the description. And if you're interested in learning about computer security, about penetration testing of web application and of Linux systems, I have created courses on Udemy. Links also in the description. Thank you very much and to the next video.